so much for joining me today, Chuck. Um, this is Global Reach's client spotlight series, uh, hopefully the first in a long series, but we've chosen to feature demonstratives um, because of your longstanding relationship with Global Reach, with our digital marketing team, and frankly, because what you do is super cool. Uh, so <laughs> we feel like why not start with with the company that's that's all about visualizing things and all about, you know, I, th I think this is going to be really um, an interesting conversation. So right. thank you. Um, for those of you tuning into this series, uh, this is Dr. Chuck Fox. He's the Director of Technical Services at Engineering Systems Incorporated, also known as ESI. Um, and so how long have you um, been in this field, in, in, in what you're doing? I'm just, just curious, because I want to kind of get a ballpark of how long of that you've been working with Global Reach. Yeah, so I'm an old timer, you know, when it comes to this field, right? It, uh, I started in the visualization business in 1995. And I joined a company called EAI uh, in, in February of 1995. I came from a postdoctoral fellowship in molecular biology. Uh, mm -hmm. How and why that makes sense is a subject of another, uh, another event. But, but I joined that company in 95, and that was in the really early days of, of 3D animation. That's, nice. that's uh, you know, we sort of measure the 3D animation world in you know, pre and post Toy Story. And that was that yeah. was pre Toy Story. Um, nice. Pixar was out there. They were a thing. They actually um, designed servers and built hardware. Um, and Isn't so, yeah. And so, you know, the very early days of using 3D animation. And of course, our space was a scientific one. And so, we were interested in leveraging 3D animation tools to you know recreate events that had happened to take data that we had at hand and and convert that into some kind of visual product. That a, that a user could consume and, and understand something about a complex event. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I suspect that the, the, the swap from molecular biology to where you are now has something to do with the human brain, but that's a story for another time, I'm sure. <laughs> it does. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit about ESI then. Well, actually, let's, I don't want to jump too far ahead. So tell me about how long you've worked with Global Reach and what that experience has been like overall. You know, Global Reach has been part of, um, you know, our experience for honestly, as long as I can remember, um, I'm trying to, uh, you know, I'm trying to recall, you can maybe help me, Stephen, when Global Reach came to the research park. Um, oh man, 25 years ago, roughly? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and you know, we've pretty much been there ever since because um, Demonstratives, the company that that was acquired by ESI that, that, you know, this group has been part of for, you know, 30 years now, spun out of EAI and you know we needed web services. Um, that yeah. was one of the things we knew we needed right away. And so Global Reach hosted our website. I remember, you know, we authored the first one, you know, and you know, you look back at those days and it was rough, right? I mean, yeah. there was yeah. nothing, you know, we weren't thinking about SEO or anything like that. We just needed a web page, right? Yeah. And then, you know, we picked up, you know, Global Reach started picking up you know, the web authoring services, things like SEO started buzzing around in our brains. And we started, you know, becoming more and more sophisticated in terms of how we were communicating with our clients online. Um, nice. And so, yeah, we've been, we've been, you know, we go back to the very, very early days of global reach as well. Yeah. It's, I, it's funny. Cause I, I kind of looked back, I remember uh, about probably about a year ago, I was like, Hey, is there any way you'd want to do a, a customer testimonial for us? And you said, yeah, sure. And you, you were very nice about it, very humble about it. And, and you said some really great things. And then I looked, I was like, wait a minute, he's already done some in the past for us. So that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, you know, so right. it's, you're one of my favorite. I know that uh, the role that I play with you is we do a lot uh, in terms of SEO and in terms of content stuff and deciding where it, what fits best there. And um, I think that's a, that's that it feels, at least to me, very important in what you guys do. So that's how I'm going to try and segue here. Tell me a little bit about um, ESI and, and specifically your role. Right. Well, ESI is an engineering consulting firm, which mm -hmm. um, you know covers a, a very broad array. And, and the company really does as well. I mean, we offer engineering consulting services in you know virtually every engineering space imaginable. So in the energy sector, transportation sectors, and human performance, all, all kinds of spaces, we have you know engineers and scientists that are experts in in those fields, and we're 
we're it's not unusual that we're helping our clients in um, you know some fairly critical situations they find themselves in. And I guess to put a finer point on that, many of the cases we work on are litigation cases where you know something has happened that you know our clients need to understand what happened in that event. It might be a ground vehicle accident. It might be a train derailment. It might be an aviation accident. It you know it, it might be you know, some breakdown in the power grid or, you know, some weather related event. There, there's all kinds of things that, that we engage with. Um, and I think what's fascinating about my role and the and my team's role, the technologists um, at ESI is that, you know, we end up getting involved in many of those cases because data has become so critical. There's almost yeah. always some form of data available and how we consume that as an organization and then turn that into something of value for our clients is, uh, you know, is a big challenge and, and one that's been, yeah. you know, fascinating to me really over the whole arc of my career in, in, in this space. You, you took the words out of my mouth. When I, when I first started working with you guys, um, it was kind of hard for me to wrap my brain around what it is you did. <laughs> and it wasn't until I started consuming some of the visual content, uh, specifically the YouTube videos and, you know, th that sort of thing that it clicked that I realized, okay, wait a minute. So these guys basically by collecting really, really finite data, things that the human eye can't even perceive sometimes, um, they're able to recreate situations where there may not have been a human witness right. and they're able to um, not only recreate that, but then recreate it in just about any consumable format from 3D images to a VR space to 3D printing. So you can physically print a scale model of, of I think, a t like a tanker and yep. hand it out in the palm of somebody's hand. And, and there's such a, there, you know, the decision making process for human beings is very tactile, right? Yes. We make a lot of decisions based on, on, on feel and on our sensory perception of it. So when I understood that that's, you basically take the invisible and you make it visible, um, it, it, it just, it blew my mind. I, I was like, this is some really cool cutting edge stuff. And, and you've written uh, some blog stuff about, you know, how, um, virtual reality is being used in retirement communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure you're very familiar with how it's being used for um, PTSD and helping deal with mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's fascinating technology. And I actually saw a report from Google, I think it was like a week ago, where they said that expect VR to continue to rise yeah. because it's going to become more readily acceptable. I mean, essentially, if you have a smartphone, you can get the Google version of, of VR. Yeah. So, it's the, the fact that it's consumable and as these, you know, Hollywood animation and video game animation companies continue to push the technology forward, it becomes more f affordable for you guys. Um, I think it's just a, a very interesting and very cool field. And so now I think one of the things that I, I, I would love to have you talk a little bit about if you can is walk us through the process of kind of collecting data, but then transforming it into a visualization aspect um, and, and how that might be able to in, influence the process or the outcome of litigation. Right. So specifically, because a lot of people, when they think of courtrooms or even if it's going through an arbitrator or whatever, they don't necessarily think of VR or 3D printed or any of that. So can you kind of walk us through start to finish how that might work? Right, exactly. It's, I, I, I'll, I'll take it for example, because it's probably the best way to handle this. And imagine sort of a hypothetical ground vehicle accident that happens at an intersection. And, you know, when you talk about data, there, there's really two forms of data that, that we would interact with in trying to understand what happened in an event like that. And I, I usually refer to them as, you know, there, there's data that we would collect. So there's collected data. And that comes in a variety of forms. Uh, we might take laser scanners out to the scene of that, the intersection where the accident happened, and we would we would laser scan it. So we have this this exquisitely accurate um, depiction of the intersection down to, you know, millimeter accuracy of every feature in that space so that we, we have um, a, a 3D environment in which to stage this, this virtual event all to scale. Um, the other thing we would do is uh, create models of the vehicles that are involved in that intersection. So we have geometrically accurate 
versions of the models. And, and those are all things that, that as technologists, we would go out and actively collect that data. Nowadays, there's another form. Well, like, when, when you say, I don't mean to catch yeah. off, when you say models, you're not talking about like model cars. Uh, necessarily, they're, right? They're digital models, right? And okay. and you can, you know, the, that's kind of the interesting thing with 3D printing, you can convert them into a little model car, right? I mean, Fair you point. can yeah. make them into yeah. that, right? But but for us, the models all exist inside of a computer, right? And And if you think about it, what we're trying to do is a lot like shooting a movie in Hollywood. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's people think of animation and maybe you sort of think about, you know, Snoopy or a Disney movie or a car Saturday morning cartoon that, you know, in the old days, you know, at least in, in the old days for me, were a lot of hand drawn frames, you know, put in sequence to, to stimulate motion. In, in our case, we're actually creating replicas of, of 3D spaces and, and objects inside of a computer and they, they can move relative to one another just as if they were in the real world. In fact, you know, we can apply physics to lots of things so that inside the computer, the rules uh, of the virtual world are, are just like the rules of, of the real world. And we can ask, how do these things behave in these spaces? That, that gets into the simulation space. And that's that's not exactly what my team does. But but we use animation as a data convergence tool. So there's this data we would collect where we can take a scan of the scene and we can take models of the vehicles and we can merge those all together to recreate what the, the the all the geometry of that day of that accident right but then yeah. there's this other data that's exquisitely interesting that's called that I refer to as found data right mm -hmm. and it's data that we might get from the municipality on the cycles of the the street lights uh, that were or not the street oh. lights the uh, signaling lights you know the stop lights that would be in that intersection yeah. We might have uh, security camera footage from a business that happened to be adjacent to the intersection and, and, it, and has, has a security camera that just kind of inadvertently captured events that happened in that intersection. And you know, we might even have dash cam footage from a, from a vehicle that was at the intersection when the accident occurred. And so the, the, those clues all become super valuable because we can assemble them all in a pretty exquisite fashion in that 3D environment to rebuild this event that, as you say, might not have been witnessed or might not have been witnessed in a way that's reliable. You know, human memory it, it is not a reliable thing. And so, you know, people will say, oh, I, you know, it happened this way. And we can show, you know, with the laws of physics that, well, you know, it kind of couldn't have happened that way. Yeah. But, you know, when we reconstruct all these pieces of data and they all happen to agree, we can be pretty confident that these vehicles moved in this fashion, that the car was going this fast, that the brakes were applied at this time. You know, there's all these events that come together to, to create a visual that's really more than just a visual. It's actually the convergence of a number of pieces of data that tell us something about the event that happened that day. So when you have video footage that is actual established video mm -hmm. footage, how does that feed into the into the data um, and into the 3D model rendering and things like that? How does that exactly, is it converted? Like you basically create a virtual version of that video frame by frame or how does that yeah, work? Yeah, and, and that's actually really close to what happens, Stephen. I mean, what, what happens is when in, in the 3D animation tools that we use to create the animation, we work with cameras. They're virtual mm -hmm. cameras, right? They're not real cameras, they're virtual cameras. But as an animator, right. we can place a camera wherever we want in the scene. And, and that camera has properties just like a real camera. You can set the focal length of the lens and you can, you can control it as if you would a camera. So when we get video that's been captured by a, a real camera, a physical camera that was in that scene, we can reconstruct the settings of that camera. We can place a virtual camera at the exact location that that camera was located in. And now we have, we can correspond exactly what's in the, the, the 2d video from the real event with the 3d space. And we can then use that as a template to work out the motions of vehicles, of pedestrians, of anything you might be interested in that particular scene. So even though the video doesn't tell you how fast the car was moving, 
Once we put that in 3D space and we can align our, the model of our car with the car in the video, we can tell you exactly how fast the car was going. That is so crazy. It's very cool. And I've seen a lot of this at, at work uh, when doing some work with your YouTube channel. Um, there's some awesome animations in there from everything about from, you know, trucks backing up and, and you know, the, how the, what the visualization in terms of streetlights and how that played in and whether or not the driver would have been able to see somebody, a pedestrian to, you know, a, a really great one that was I mean, it's, it's practical. It looks like it either came straight out of a modern PS5 video game or a movie, but it's it's the uh, there's an ATV one that's really, really yeah. cool. Yeah. I mean, you've got some really amazing videos there. And what I find fascinating about this is that you use all of this to create 3D animations and show how things went with irrefutable data. So it's not there's not opinion with it. You're basically recreating events uh, and and letting people witness history when they weren't there. But what's really cool is you can take that same 3D space and put some, I want to say physically, but digitally put someone in it through virtual reality. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about how, what that experience is like and, and how you've actually used that in litigation law firm settings without, I mean, obviously you can't talk about cases, I'm sure, sure. but if you can give us some, some examples, that'd be great. Yeah. I think, you know, so for 25 of those 30 years, you know, we were sort of stuck with having to render the visual that we were going to use offline, meaning that we couldn't render it fast enough that you could watch it in real time in any way. So we have, a, um, you know, upstairs at, at uh, ESI there in, in, in Ames, we have mm -hmm. a closet. It's not a closet. It's a cold room that's just full of computers. And those computers are yes, all sure. dedicated to rendering frames of animation. And when we're when we're rendering an animation, um, it might take you know overnight, you know, to get five minutes, you know, of animation rendered. So you can't really watch it, you know, on the computer in real time until it's done rendering. And then you put the frames together as a movie, and boom, you can you can watch this thing play out, right? But in the last, in the more recent five years, you know, real-time rendering has become a real thing. And, the, and you were talking about it earlier, you know, the gaming community has really driven a lot of that with, with these head-mounted displays that are, you know, consumer priced. You know, you can buy an Oculus Quest 2 for, you know, $300 now. And it's a very capable uh, VR headset. And so mm -hmm. a lot of technology has evolved with the idea that, hey, we want to be able to render these animated scenes in a way that you can watch it in real time. And, and so what that enables, you might be thinking, oh, okay, cool, I can see it sooner. Well, it's way more than that because now I can look anywhere I want in my 3D scene. If you think about that intersection we talked about earlier and the vehicles we talked about earlier, if I render an animation of that, I have to choose the camera view and I'm, I'm sort of dictating what the viewer of that movie is going to see. If I can render it in real time, I can sit in the driver's seat of the car virtually and I can look any direction I want during that accident sequence. So as, as engineers and scientists, we can define what the movements of everything should be in that scene. And we can have that accident sequence happen. And then we can put you in it as a, as a pedestrian, as a, as a you know, vehicle driver, as a driver of all the different vehicles may be involved in that accident sequence. And you get to witness it, not from one point of view, but from multiple points of view. And perhaps right. you have a witness, a bystander who has said, well, I saw the whole thing happen and this, it looked like this. Well, you can go stand at the position that they claim they were at when the accident happened and see what they could see. What did it look like? Does our rendition of this agree with what they're seeing? Or can we figure out if we think what they're telling us doesn't jibe with what could have happened. Maybe why would that be true? Why did they see something? So what real-time rendering does is it gives us like an, you know, many, many, many more bites at the apple of looking at some event happen over and over and over again. And through that iteration, um, we learn from the visualization. 
Yeah, we input. I'm really surprised that you guys don't do more with like CSI, like, <laughs> like you know, FBI and crime scene investigation stuff. That's that's you know, with law enforcement, and maybe you do. I don't. I don't know. I know ESI is a pretty massive company, and you know, we we, we certainly do get data, you know, frequently from law enforcement. A lot of the data collection tools we use are now you know, in the hands of law enforcement and used frequently, you know, at accident scenes and things like that to, to capture them. So, um, yeah. so we, we do rely on data frequently in that, in that space, but yeah, it's, you know, these are turning out to be exquisitely valuable tools. And, and, and you know, honestly, when we talk about the real time visualization space and VR and that, this is just emerging. I mean, this yeah. is not something that's been around a long time. It, you know, You're we're, the yeah, it's I mean, the it's the bleeding edge. We're still learning, yeah you know, how to use it effectively, but we've used it in, in a number of cases now really effectively. And, and I, I've kind of talked to a number of attorneys about this, you know, I, you know, when I started in the animation business, you know, I'll admit that it was a very creative process and we didn't have a lot of data to rely on. We might have a handful of photographs and a police diagram. We didn't have laser scanners. We didn't have drones. We weren't collecting highly detailed data as animators, there was a lot of creative input in terms of how did this move? Well, you know, what should we do now? Now there's almost zero wiggle room for an animator to do something creative. And the creativity is rather moved to the space of how do I, how do I combine these data sets? How do I figure out how to make these data sets interact on a common time scale? so we can extract the information out of them. And the one thing that was missing is frequently in an accident sequence, well, where was that person looking during this accident sequence? There was no data to tell you where the human was looking in that. And now, yeah. nowadays I get, you know, and, and, and I guess to, to extend that thought, as animators, we were often put on the spot to decide what that was. Here's where you're gonna point yeah. the camera, right? We're gonna just point, I guess they must've been looking out the windshield, right? So we point the camera straight ahead. Now what we can do with real-time tools is we can build all the way up to that point. Then we can put the expert, the testifying expert who is going to render an opinion about what happened in this case. We can put them in the driver's seat and we can let them look wherever they want to look. And, and they can essentially guide that animation instead of, you know, someone on the animation team. And it's, it's resulted into a whole nother layer of realism you know, in terms of what we create. And, and I think a whole nother layer of value for the information we get out of it. What's really fascinating to me is, is it's perception is reality. I mean, that's, that's a, a very common phrase, but it's one that I really believe wholeheartedly. And what's interesting is that with this technology, you're able to perceive things that normally you, you wouldn't even consider perceiving. So for example, if somebody gets into some kind of an accident and says that there was a seatbelt malfunction and tries to sue the manufacturer, you would be able to, using the data and the that everything that you've collected be able to see whether or not that was accurate and it very well could be so depending right. on who you're representing in that situation it could go either way so i'm sure there's times that you have to tell clients the news they don't want to hear which is the data is not on your side oh, absolutely <laughs> you, a, but absolutely you can't you can't fight the data and i think that's really fascinating and to kind of tie all of that together with what uh you and i have talked about in the past the single most popular and successful video on on the youtube channel is the Princess Diana mm -hmm. recreation. And what's amazing is you mentioned that back then, when, when that was created so many years ago, there was a certain element of educated guess, I would say, just in terms of perspective, right? But you still had enough to enough data to go off of to recreate this. And so it, it's amazing to me with the technology you had then. Can you, you've told me about this, so I want you to tell this to, to you, your audience, because I think this is such a cool thing uh, as, as far as your estimates compared to. Oh, the yeah, official sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so that one was fascinating because we um, that was back uh, in the EAI days and we actually had an employee at ESI that was in Paris at the time and they were able to get the drawings for the tunnel you know, for us. So we knew exactly, you know, the dimension, the design dimensions for this particular tunnel and the spacing of the, the pillars that were in the tunnel, the car struck a, a pillar that was in the middle of the tunnel. And we had, we relied upon photographs. There were a lot of, you know, press photos uh, from that event. And, you know, 
there was wild speculation going on at the time that, you know, this car was going crazy fast and, you know, it was sort of running from the paparazzi and that, you know, it had these tremendous impact speeds when it, when it hit the internals of the tunnel. And, you know, there were three fatalities out of four um, in that car. So, you know, sort of a, the, the, the speculation aligned with the events. And it's not unusual in these accidents. You, it happens in aviation accidents, any of these high profile things, you get a lot of speculation that happens early on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our guys were looking at things like skid marks and the damage to the car and how far the car ended up away from its point of impact and said, car wasn't going that fast. I mean, there's just no way. And so when, you know, the engineers sat down and really took this apart and, and one of my partners, Dan Kruger, worked on this case actually for the Discovery Channel. They were interested in having us do a piece on it before the French authorities had determined anything about the accident or had before they'd released anything. And I think he computed that the car entered the tunnel at around 61 miles an hour, far lower than anybody had speculated. And that was based upon some skid marks that were left on the, on the pavement. And then that it impacted the, the, uh, the, the pillar in the tunnel, I want to say around 48 miles an hour, something like that, which was again, far lower than the estimates. And uh, lo and behold, when the French authorities came out with their numbers, I think we were within one mile an hour uh, of, of their data set, you know, based upon crazy? press photos and, you know, evidence that you could see it was there if you knew what to look for. And, um, you know, the, the, the moral of the story that came out of that one that I think makes it such a powerful story is that Mercedes Benz was well equipped to handle that kind of impact. There, there were yep. three fatalities, including the princess in that, accident and nobody needed to die. And the thing that yeah. the, the thing that happened in that in that case was the three people that died in that accident did not have their seatbelt fastened. The one person that survived and that was her bodyguard was in the front passenger seat and he had his seatbelt fastened and while he sustained serious injuries, you know, he survived that accident and it was actually the the princess's momentum you know, when they hit the, when they hit the pillar, you always kind of say there's three impacts in an accident, the car impacting the, the object. In this case, the car had some crush associated with it, which gives a deceleration. But instead of, you know, Diana being tightly coupled to the car and decelerating over that period of time, she just moved onward with the speed of the car until her chest hit the yeah, back of the passenger seat. And then the third impact came and that was her you know, cardiovascular system with, with the inside of her body, there was a, it was a, you know, abrupt deceleration that caused her, her fatal injuries. Had she had that seatbelt fastened and been coupled to that vehicle, um, she very likely would have survived. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And, and the fact that you guys were able to, to put together a, um, dare I say, TV worthy animation <laughs> yeah. back then, um, based on data that was, that was, by today's standard, kind of scarce, right? It was, right. I mean, you're literally taking just some blueprints essentially and some press photography and that's about it and, right. and be able to recreate it and understand the science and the physics behind it so well, you're within one mile an hour of the official. That's that's impressive. Yeah, Even and, for back and you're the for, for now, is. that's impressive let alone back then. Yeah, it's so. absolutely right. And, and, you know, given the precision of the instrumentation we have now, you know, it's, it, you know, the, the amount of error is, is really small. Right. And, and had there been security cameras, had there been more of these things that are just ubiquitous in our life. Now, people with iPhones yeah. and things like that, you can see how you can converge all these data onto a, very accurate representation of, of some event that happened. Yeah. And, and now you're collecting data in a whole new way. I mean, you're using drones, yeah. which mm -hmm. a lot of people don't think of drones as scanning technology, but the amount of data that you can pick up, uh, the, the, the key phrase that I've been using a lot when doing some of your SEO and doing some of your video optimization is that drones can go where people can't and collect data that is otherwise inaccessible. That's right. And it's, it's, it's so interesting because people do think of drones for photography and they think of drones for uh, package delivery mm -hmm. in some cases. Mm -hmm. 
and, and as toys, but nobody really thinks of them necessarily. I think the average person, I shouldn't say nobody, obviously you guys do, but I think the average person doesn't necessarily think of drones as a data collection tool. Right. And the fact that you can collect these points of data over, you know, a football field size or a huge factory after a tornado or anything like that, and then also collect hand scans, you're getting data that that is just I, I just think it's it's awesome. I think you guys are at the forefront of technology. I think you're at the forefront of of visualization. And that was one of the main reasons that when I had the idea to do this series, I thought, I gotta talk to Dr. Fox. I gotta see if, he, <laughs> if he's willing to tell the world about this because it's such it's so cool. So um, at what point, because I know this is important too, and this is from our past conversations, but at what point should a you know law firm or some kind of legal representation get in touch with you? and get in touch with ESI to figure out, I mean, yeah, like what's the window there that people would want to reach out to ESI to figure this out and start the process? Right, well, the the as early as possible in terms of data collection, for sure, because, you know, the, the, the higher quality data we have, the more accurate the rendition, you know, that we're going to be able to, to create. And so, you know, for example, an, an accident happens at an intersection, getting a laser scan of that intersection at, at a reasonable point in time. It's not like we need to be there at the time of the accident. That's probably not going to happen. And, it, sure. and perhaps law enforcement officers that are there at the time of the accident are collecting laser scan data. That's a possibility. So, Clients need to be aware, attorneys need to be aware that that's something to ask about, you know, is was data collected at the time of the accident? Um, because access to that is is um, is valuable. And it's not that we can't reconstruct something. So, you know, we've been brought into cases a year after the accident occurred and we'll go out and scan the intersection. And we can always look at that against police photos and see that, oh, some things have changed. And we can go back and fix those, you know, in the scene. But those are costly things to do when you have to start modifying it. And so if you have a scan from the from close to the event, that's super helpful, right? Yeah. And then yeah, yeah. and then I think there's a phase of this, and and you hinted at it earlier that hey, sometimes the you know the outcome may not be in your favor from your perspective. That you know your client might not be in the best you know situation here. It's best to know that early, I think, so that, you know, as, as an attorney, you can figure out, you know, where am I going to go with this? What are we going to chase in this case? What's important to us in this case? So, you know, it's important to us to be able to deliver on, you know, what the outcome might be as quickly and as inexpensively as possibly as we possibly can. So creating that value early on with scan data. So, for example, jumping into the scan data in VR and be able to kind of move through the intersection, maybe at the seat height of the vehicle, you know, we can do some things where it's not beautiful finished animation. We didn't put a whole bunch of work into getting the lighting just right or anything like that. We just take some quick, you know, views to kind of get a sense of what's it look like, you know, how did this play out, you know, and, and it, that helps us hit decision points with the whole team, with all the stakeholders to say, hey, what should we do next? Should we, you know, should we build out this scene in detail? Do we think that, you know, this tree might have obscured someone's view, but it's kind of hard to tell from the laser scan. Maybe we need to build out more detail. Maybe it was at night and we do need to get some street lights in here and understand which ones were on, which ones might have been non-functional and light the scene so we can get a sense of what that looks like. We can make those kind of decisions. And if the news is just not that great, you know, hey, yeah. it looks like my client just, you know, I don't know what happened, but they just ran over this pedestrian, right? And we don't have a, you know, it's yeah. best you know, right? And it's best you know yeah. early. And so, uh, you know, I kind of, I like to say that we try to design solutions that scale economically with the case. And by that, I mean, you know, you kind of want to know where you stand in this in this litigation and, and whether it's going to go forward or not. And we try to give you answers early on that, in, that inform you know, mm -hmm. what the next move looks like. Yeah. So you, you're trying to help get use, you're trying to use your technology to help determine an answer essentially, or the closest thing you possibly can to it. Um, and that's kind of the, the base level thing. And then 
what you do with that from that point forward is depends on where they want to go. So it may be that they get this information and say, you know what, we need to settle outside. We need to settle out of court. Yeah. Or, you know, we should totally take this to trial all the way and we should fight it because this is something that we can win. So how can you make this look amazing? Right. So in the practical application sense of, of the animations that you create or the 3D renderings that you create or the 3D physical model, the 3D printed models, what is the application of that look like in a courtroom, for example? So say we, it's not two person litigation or anything like that or team, it's in a courtroom setting where I as a juror would be able to see it. Obviously you can't, at least right now, give everybody a VR headset, right? right? So, so it, it, what, it, can you tell me a little bit about what those solutions look like in, in a real world practical application, how that can kind of change outcomes of, of a case? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think that we think a lot about, you know, uh, how to use VR, like like the, that particular tool is an interesting one because a lot of times I see attorneys at conferences and, you know, we'll have a VR set up there to do some demos and people say, oh, have you ever had these on a juror? It's like, no, you know, and I'm, maybe I'm more cynical than I should be, but you know, I'm sort of pessimistic about that happening anytime real soon because it was pretty complicated to get 3D animations in the courtroom and to create the proper foundation and, and you know, be able to put something on a screen that, that passes muster, you know, for the courtroom is not trivial. And you know, for sure. a judge to consider, uh, we're going to put head mounted displays on these jurors. I mean, I can certainly envision scenarios where that that might be helpful, like to visit a crime scene or, you know, a particular hazardous location where you really don't want to, you know, take people there. It would be prohibitively expensive to do so. Sure, we could use VR to transport folks there, but typically we're using it as a tool to develop the animation. So with the stakeholders, we'll use VR to explore a variety of scenarios and try to understand you know, did that tree obstruct some point of view or how many times, you know, do we really, should, let's move through this intersection a bunch of times and explore, you know, what could have been seen and things. And then ultimately, uh, because the environments we create for VR are the same environments we use for 3D animation, we mm -hmm. can simply render out an animation at the end of the day that's going to get shown on a screen in the courtroom and the jurors can comfortably sit on their chair. We don't have to worry about them getting nauseous with a with a VR headset on. And they, they're yeah. gonna watch the animation play out on a screen, even though that uh, VR was used to develop what we were gonna show in that particular And it's super impactful too. It's super some, of the, some of the things that you see, it's just like, I don't know. I think, I think you know, when you, to, to change hearts and minds, you have to speak to people on a, on a very personal level. Um, and I think that when you can witness things that like I, when you can witness things that you couldn't otherwise witness, it makes a difference. Right. And so another practical application that I had thought of a while back was for, for the 3D printing mm -hmm. stuff. Like if you have two parts that work together a certain way, you can print out how it's supposed to look. And then what, using the data that was collected from from it, you can see if there was a problem that gears didn't work together right yep. or whatever from the actual situation well, and, the cool, and i the think cool. having that to see that tactically yep. would make a difference absolutely too. and the cool thing about that is um typically we're using 3d animation in tandem with animation so there's some really there's some animation that's showing some maybe elaborate mechanical process or something going on and like we said earlier you know hey that car that's a model well, when we say it's a virtual 3D model, it can be a physical model. And so we can rend we can essentially render with a 3D printer some component of an animation. And so it looks exactly like it does in the animation, but you can hold it in your hand. And, and as you said, that has a really powerful impact. And, you know, it, we can do things if you think about scale as well. Maybe there's something super tiny that you're showing that's, you know, you can't really see that well with a naked eye, but we can show it clearly in the animation and we can print it at 10 times its normal size so you can hold it in your hand. Or maybe it's the opposite, you know, maybe it's a super tanker that, you know, had some kind of accident or, or, or there's an alleged failure and you see it on the animation and then you can hold the super tanker in your hand, you know, yeah. those are, those are powerful moments, I think.
That's crazy. It's and and all of this is just admissible evidence because it's all well. I mean, it's 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 so relevant to what's happening that it's it's undeniable, especially since you use solid data that couldn't otherwise be collected. Yeah, and, any and, and I'll comment on that because the attorneys that might be listening often ask me about things like this. What well, and, and and there's really two kinds of evidence from my perspective. Uh, you know, demonstrative evidence and 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 evidence that actually gets admitted. And typically yeah. demonstrative evidence when it comes into the courtroom is uh, it's not entered into the trial record as evidence. It's sponsored by an expert who's going to testify with it. And it's used by that expert during the course of their, uh, 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 their testimony, but it, 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 it does not go into the record. The jurors can't interact with it when they're deliberating. If the case is appealed, it does not go on with the appeal because it's not, Part of the record. We have on a number of occasions created animations that went into the record as evidence. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm trying, I think all those examples were patent litigation where we made animations um, of objects that were uh, described in patents and didn't physically exist. Yeah. And so they the the judge in those cases allowed them to come into the record because you know, the argument is, hey, if I physically had this thing, I would bring it in and we would tag it as evidence, but it doesn't exist. It's it's exists in this patent. And and we can argue successfully that this is a fair and accurate depiction of what this patent describes. And therefore, it, it enters in on the record. In fact, one of them uh, did get appealed and ultimately was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court in the U.S. It was the KSRB Teleflex case. And the, the Supreme Court was, you know, took it because it was a case that had an important bearing on what obviousness means when it comes to patent litigation. And so yeah. I think we have that. We, we consider that a great honor that, you know, animations, you know, made it to the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm sure it's the first time of many, <laughs> to be honest with you. I really am sure that it's the first of many. So let's kind of talk about the, the future of this. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that there's we can always I, I, I'm a, a video game nut. When I was a kid, I played Mario. And before that, I played Atari. And, you know, I, I remember when Sony came out with PlayStation and there were these amazing cutscenes. I thought, I wish, I can't wait until the, the whole game looks like this cutscene. Yeah. Because here you see this almost photorealistic cutscene, and then you go back to your choppy, crappy, you know, right. graphic. Right. And now we're in a world in the video game space where it looks, everything's photorealistic. Yeah. You can't tell. There's times when I've been, I've played a game where I don't know if I'm in a cutscene or in the actual game. And if I stop messing around with the controller, the game, you know, might crash or, you know, right, you, know right. so you can dream about what you think the future holds, but it's amazing to me that, that you can build it as well. Yeah. And so on that note, um, I've seen, because I find the whole VR and AR space and all of this very fascinating. And I have other clients that I work with who do a lot for, for example, um, soldiers who have PTSD. Mm -hmm. And so they come back and they use virtual reality therapy to help them get through it by reliving it over and over and over again. And it sounds very traumatic and it is, and it can be very traumatizing, but it also can have a very strong healing effect. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've also worked with a client um, that they basically had created a, a, a model that they called the cave and it was a giant um, 3D space that essentially it, you walk into this room and everything around you from ceiling to floor, you're sitting inside of a blood vessel or something like yep. that. And, and, it, and it's amazing to me. So I'm wondering if, if that's something that you guys see yourself. I mean, what's, what's the future, not just for VR and litigation and for, for animation and litigation, but also for ESI, what do you think the future holds the direction you're going? Is there anything you can kind of peel back and give a teaser on that you think your team was working on? Yeah, for sure. I, I think that, um, a lot of the value and the data we have relates to how quickly we can interact with it. Sure. And, and, and as you, as you know, Stephen, like laser scanning data and the drone data we capture and things like that is it's big, heavy data. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing that's starting to change is, you know, we're developing ways to interact with that data really quickly. So rather than going out in the field and, you know, collecting data and say, hey, you know, we'll get back with you in a couple of months and show you what that looks like. Right. 
it's going to, it's going to, we're going to move toward real time and we're going to actually have access to data, perhaps actionable right in the field. So I see a day where, you know, we'll take a scanner into the field and somebody will be able to sit with VR headsets on in a lab or in their office and actually be in that space, you know, nearly in real time with a scanner in that 3D space. It's sort of like you, the jump we went through when we went from, you know, taking pictures on film, right? And you dropped it off at the drugstore and you came back a week later and got your pictures to now yeah. digital cameras where you take the picture and you can look at it and decide whether you really want to keep that one or if you want to delete it, right? Yeah. And so yeah. I think that level of interaction with data uh, is going to have a really high degree of value with our clients. And I think that combined with being able to access it remotely, you know, that, hey, you don't, you don't have to be on site to interact with a scene, whether it's, whether that site is a, a intersection where a vehicle accident happened or whether it's some microscopic fracture surface on a part that we want to mm -hmm. interact with, that you can have intimate interaction with that data, you know, virtually at another location or with a team that's distributed around the world. Um, and so I think that's, I think that's where we're headed. I think the, 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 the rendered permanent kind of thing, um, is probably still in the pictures of deliverable for some time, but I think the way we get there is going to change pretty dramatically. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I know we're kind of running out of time a little bit here, but there was two little things that I wanted to, and I'm going to give you a choice, which direction we go. Oh, great. All right, cool. I said, choose your own adventure. Yeah. Part. I was going to say, yeah. So, so the first, we've talked pretty extensively about VR and how, how you can put people in this. But um, I recently discovered while going through some of the stuff that you guys have done and all that, that there is a thing called multi-user VR. Okay. So that's the first thing. Put a pin in that. The second thing is ESI Live, which is kind of what you're hinting at a little bit. So I'll let you decide which way you want to take this because I know that both of them are, are really kind of intertwined, but still. Yeah, you're going to. So that's a tough choice. So I'm going to actually use them both. I'm going to I'm going to intertwine them for you. Right. Because be ESI Live is really a delivery platform that we use to bring our clients into uh, at this point you know, physical inspections, you know, that's a big part of our, our business model is, is, is looking at things that have been damaged, trying to find out, you know, why something happened. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things we thought about as we, as we started conducting these remote inspections during COVID travel restrictions and there, you know, all these reasons we couldn't get together and needed to do so virtually was why are we doing this just for inspections? I mean, we have this awesome, you know, virtual data that we can interact with. Why should we stop our remote interactions at the point of the inspection? And so multi-user VR was born, you know, from that insight that, hey, you know, we could have this 3D object sort of centrally located on the cloud, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. And people could log in with headsets or their computer screens from any location and move around it and interact with it, essentially have an independence in that 3D scene. So we could all just meet up like at an inter accident or an, or an intersection where an accident occurred or around um, maybe an artifact that we've scanned and want to interact with. And so, yeah, I, multi, uh, you look, the power of teams is undeniable. You know, when you get multiple people together and start, or start thinking about a problem, it's way more powerful than, than any given individual. And so that's really what we're attempting to power, both for physical events and you know for virtual events, is is putting that brain trust together and interacting as a team. Sounds like a potentially uh, traumatic virtual coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, it's it's it really when when you can start converging data from these multiple locations and you can interact with them you know, as a team, it, you know, powerful outcomes emerge really quickly. Um, so this is, this is all very theoretical, the way that we're talking about it. So to kind of paint a picture in real world for, for the audience here, 
one of the the one that I saw had a train car on it on a train track, mm -hmm. and it wasn't you know like beautifully polished, realistic looking, but you could tell that this is exactly what this is meant to be. And the multi-user interface showed one person that was at the front of the train, one that was at the side, and so people were able to explore the space and see it from their perspective, what they needed to see, while all being able to see the same thing. And they could also see where the other users were yeah, as well. Yeah, I, so if you and I were talking, I could say, hey, come take a look at this. This is really cool. And you, or this is interesting. And you can come over in that space to see it. And it, it was very, I mean, if you would have just multi-user VR, if you would have said that to me, I would have been, okay. But seeing that, again, it's seeing as believing perception it's, reality. It's, you right. know, I can tell you from particip participating in these sessions, it's, it's wildly, uh, it's a crazy experience because your brain just sort of accepts very quickly. Oh, I'm just in this space, right? And I'm going to interact. And, and you turn to the person next to you, their avatar, and you talk to them, right? Like, yeah. like you're somehow there, right? And you're not, yeah. right? You're maybe 900 miles apart. But yeah. you have this interaction that's 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 amazing, and it's it's really cool to interact with teams in that kind of space. It's 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 wild how quickly our brains accept it. So uh, I, I'm I'm I know they're not the same thing, but I'm a big fan of augmented reality mm -hmm. as well, and how that technology can be used. Um, do you guys do anything with that? Is there any plan to do anything with that? Is it a different world altogether? And I'm off base because I don't know what I'm talking about. No, it's 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 a very similar world, very close cousin, you know, to virtual reality. And you know, to some extent, we're very interested in augmented reality. Um, we can envision a number of applications for augmented reality. You know, for example, you could see an engineer in an inspection where they could have augmented reality glasses on and be interacting with a physical part, but actually have metadata. To, you know, associated with it, you know, right at their, you know, more than their fingertips, like, you know, right in their field of view. Um, so there's a bunch of really super cool things with that. We're, uh, to, we're really kind of waiting for that hardware industry to sort out, to kind of decide yeah. where we ought to go with that. So we have yeah. some experience in some augmented reality spaces. It's experimental for us right now. It's not something we're doing, you know, live with clients yet but that's definitely a future direction. It's always good to peel back the curtain and see where, mm -hmm. where, where it is in that world. So, right. I mean, what's amazing to me about ESI is that there's so many applications. You and I have literally just, even this conversation, just scratched the surface. Yeah. I mean, there's industrial applications where you're talking about factories and maybe there was a big horrible explosion and you don't know what happened. So it may not be safe to have people see that inspe inspection right. process. Right. So being able to have all the stakeholders there virtually through ESI Live is so, like you used the word before, so I'm gonna steal it, bleeding edge. It yeah. is so bleeding yeah. edge. And then the same type of thing with being able to recreate. So uh, I think I'll leave you with, thank you. First off, before I forget, thank you so much for being a part oh. of the client spot. Thank, thank you, Stephen. This is, thank you. It's a great, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to leave you with this question. Uh, was there or was there not a second gunman at the grassy knoll? Go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if anybody yes, can figure it how out. About, how about team. yes and no? <laughs> okay all right i'll roll with it sure I, that would be one of those things that i think would be interesting for you guys to do i mean it's, right it's right it's there's such cool pieces of history that can be recreated with this technology and i'm sure if you don't have a reason to why spend a ton of money on it but it's uh it's definitely a neat space to be in and, and so i really do appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today absolutely thank so, you Stephen. when we have some spare time we'll take that one on yeah. yeah, that'd be cool. When you do, I, I can't wait to see it because that's there's the Discovery Channel. Right, exactly. You. Right. There's the one. Yep. yep. We're going to need you. So thank you so much for being a part of this. And um, if anybody wants to get a hold of uh, ESI and talk about this further, how can they do that? So they can reach me at uh, cafox at ngsys.com. And I'm sure we can pop that up on a on a screen here or, or get that to folks uh, in a more consumable way. So uh, they can feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to have conversations about this. If someone's interested in, um, in, how, in talking to me about it, um, I'm happy to provide you, Stephen, with my contact info so we can 
we Perfect. can get that to people in a way that's more consumable than me just kind of blurting it out here on a on a call. Sure. Yeah. No, I totally understand that because you know evergreen video. So why not? Right. Right. No, right. Make sure that you had some kind of call to action if you wanted to. You know, um, and the website is engsys dot com. Right. Engsys. Um, Engsys yeah. is how I think about it. Easy to remember, but it's engineering systems. Yep. Engsys dot com. Dot com. So thank you so much again, and we will um, definitely look forward to what the future holds for ESI. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stephen. I appreciate it. You're very welcome.